Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Thank you to Ed uh, for that great explanation of Internet of Things. And thank you so much to the students who are actually building things. It's, uh, it's amazing as the hardware commodifies and uh, I wouldn't say democratizes, but anybody can go buy, uh, buy a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. There are Bitcoin ATMs that are running on Raspberry Pi now, so uh, let's go out and make stuff. We have an amazing panel. We're going to discuss the security implications of Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, as Ed said, and uh, introduce some of the panelists. We're going to do introductions in a couple minutes about your background. Hi, um, I'm Alex Halderman. I am, uh, in addition to being um, a very proud uh, uh, Princeton alum, I'm now a professor at the University of Michigan in computer science uh, where I study computer security and privacy with an emphasis on its connections to, uh, to broader society and public policy. Um, I've done quite a bit of work over the years looking at the way computer security fails in, um, in different contexts including things like uh, electronic voting machines, um, server systems, um, and also increasingly devices that are connected to the internet in the style of these uh, fabulous new inventions that we've seen demoed just a few minutes ago. Hi, I'm Ed Felton. I'm a professor at Princeton in computer science and public policy. Um, my main, um, uh, some of my main areas of, uh, of scholarship involve security, computer security and privacy, um, especially relating to consumer products and uh, everyday sorts of devices. Hi, I'm Mark Eichhorn. I'm in the FTC's Division of Privacy and Identity Protection and um, my Commissioner Julie Brill is right there, and my colleague Jared Ho. Um, and uh, so we are interested in privacy and data security and enforce a number of federal statutes that uh, require data security. Um, and we recently held a workshop in November on um, the Internet of Things. And one of the things that struck me there, and we can talk about it over the course of the panel, but um, there was pretty widespread agreement from from the people who came that you know security is not top of mind for um, people putting out products in the space, and I was kind of surprised to hear that because we had we had you know some hacker types and some sort of security researcher types there, and I would expect to have heard that message from them, but we basically heard it from basically everybody. Um, including a lot of the companies that were there as well. So um, that's my story. And you're sticking to it. No. <laughs> so uh, Steve Rosa, um, I'm co-chair of the privacy and data security team at Holland and Knight <clears throat> here in the offices here in New York and other places. And what I do day to day is basically uh, tell companies no, you know, capital N, capital O, no, you can't do that because otherwise you're going to hear from Mark and Commissioner Brill. Um, so what we do is we do a lot of work on um, privacy and security compliance for websites, uh, mobile apps, and increasingly um, sort of uh, network aware devices and products that aren't altogether different from Bonnie's pillow, believe it or not. Um, so nice to be here. And. Um I should introduce myself as well, Andy Roth, uh, lead the global privacy and security practice at Denton's. Joined the firm about a year ago. Before that, I was the chief privacy officer for American Express for six years and uh, do a lot of work in this space. I think it's important to, Internet of Things, when the term was uh, began to be used a couple of years ago, it seemed like a far off concept. As we discuss it today, with students actually building things with a lot of commercialized products, it feels like we're almost there already. And, uh, and if you think about the spectrum of sensors being embedded into our everyday lives, on the extreme side, you could think about a sensor for every atomic particle. I think we're probably farther away from that, but we're moving pretty quickly. So I, I think one of the misperceptions about this space is that 
structurally, it's very similar and, and from a policy standpoint, maybe it should be considered in the same way traditional technology has. And uh, one of the most persuasive arguments against that is that there's really different technology that will be at play when we start to deploy this at a, on a nano level. One of those issues is battery life. So currently we use battery and then we run it down to zero and then we charge it all the way back up again. And as we start to distribute these sensors into the world, we're going to have to change that paradigm and we're going to have to be always on. Um, so Alex, um, who has an incredible technical background, you discuss some of the security challenges associated with Internet of Things and connected <coughs> devices. Sure. Well, um, uh, we've seen in other contexts where um, embedded systems have uh, um, have have come into play um, a variety of really um, uh, very scary kinds of security problems. Um, uh, if you um, look at things like uh, uh, like voting machines, like cars, other contexts where um, you have a, a traditional application that for, for uh, most of its existence um, did not involve computerization, did not involve um, being connected to uh, a data network. Um, and you have the technology evolve to the point where um, uh, uh, it's adding computerization and networking. Um, what we've seen in other applications is a kind of technological phase change that happens. Um, all of a sudden, you shift from an application with very little computer security attack surface to one where, um, uh, where there are um, vulnerabilities to network-based network attackers, vulnerabilities to, um, uh, to uh, attackers leveraging the power of the computerization uh, in order to make the application misbehave. So we've seen um, this kind of pattern repeated um, uh, in other contexts where uh, uh, a phase change happens when you introduce uh, computer and network capabilities to a traditional application. Um, and that's something that's, uh, that I'm worried is going to repeat itself within the, uh, the new Internet of Things um, context we're seeing today. So something like uh, as, as simple as your pillow, right? Your smart pillow. So suddenly you have a pillow that's tracking your sleep patterns and posting the data to the web. Um, this is uh, uh, obviously collecting uh, a lot of data from a sensitive um, social context that if it falls into the wrong hands um, is uh, going to uh, uh, be very worrisome from a privacy perspective. Um, particularly if, uh, in uh, answer to the question, it can also track who is lying on that pillow. Um, uh, so um, uh, here, here we have uh, technology that forever had nothing to do with computerization. Now you're, you're throwing in network capabilities. Can someone attack that to steal information uh, about the person and their private activities? Um, another place where I'm, I'm particularly worried about security is uh, coming from the, the angle that embedded systems behave differently um, uh, and are developed differently than traditional client-server systems. So embedded systems, um, uh, things uh, like programming microcontrollers to do uh, simple tasks, um, are... Uh, 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 come from almost a, a separate kind of developer culture within the software world than traditional client-server systems. And in um, uh, that embedded systems world, the focus is often on pushing the envelope to make technology do, uh, do things more cheaply, do things with less power, do things in incredibly tight envelopes of uh, uh, amount of resources available. Um, security has not been something that embedded systems people have, um, have thought about nearly as much as people who uh, develop client-server applications that have, uh, 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 that have traditionally faced powerful network attackers. So there's this culture shift where in embedded systems we don't have, the, uh, uh, we, we don't have as, as, as much of a culture of thinking about security, thinking about how systems are going to be attacked. Um, I worked with a, a company last summer, a major um, uh, producer of uh, 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 technology for controlling servers in corporate data centers. 
And um, they had, um, uh, they were primarily a hardware company. But suddenly they added um, basically an Internet of Things kind of sensor system to their servers uh, in order to allow them to be remotely controlled. Just a little chip, basically the same thing that's in uh, the, the pillow or the lamp we just saw. Um, and at that point, um, they realized that they did not have anyone in the company who had any security training when it came to software development. They knew how to build embedded systems, they knew how to build hardware, but they didn't know anything about software or network security. And uh, their first generation of products turned out to suffer from um, just about every textbook vulnerability it possibly could um, because the culture wasn't there. So this culture clash between embedded systems and traditional systems is really scary. Um, the, the last thing I worry about is the social uh, uh, challenges that are raised by, uh, by this, this kind of technological change. That we have expectations, we have norms about what the traditional technology around us can do, what its capabilities are. Um, things like uh, uh, a watch or a pillow, we have expectations about what they can do, whether they can track us, uh, whether they can be used, um, uh, whether they can be, be used to spy on us or report on us. And um, as technology gains new capabilities, maybe um, our existing structure of norms and expectations is going to be challenged by that. And I think that's going to be an area where the, the law faces big challenges too. And I, I hope we can elaborate on that in the, over the course of the panel. I, I think that's a, that's a critical point is that you, we've got this grid, everything will be connected. Trust and authentication becomes a major issue, and, and that's an issue that Ed has looked at extensively. Ed, can you talk about some of the issues and concerns? Sure. Um, it, it's true that you, you uh, as you move to an Internet of Things world, you have these devices um, out there which are capable of networking. They will want to talk to each other. Um, your pencil may know something that's useful to your shoes. Um, or, uh, uh, or vice versa. Your, uh, for sure, your shoes probably know something that might be interesting to your, to your thermostat. Um, and so these devices will want to talk to each other um, in order to help you. But the problem is, or one of the problems is, how the devices know which ones they should cooperate with, which other devices they should be willing to share information with. Um, in, uh, in, in traditional computer systems, we tend to think about authentication and access control, that is knowing who you're talking to and making sure you're revealing information only to the people you want to reveal it to. We tend to think about this in terms of identifying um, authorizing people. And so you might log in, you might have your fingerprint scanned or something like that. Um, or there being fixed relationships between the devices which are programmed in by people. Um, but uh, if you think about a consumer taking some uh, object, say a pencil, out of a box, uh, you sharpen it and you just start writing. You don't uh, open up the configurations control panel and make sure that it's uh, set up right. Um, you don't um, log into your pencil. Um, not, it's not just that it's a huge pain in the neck to do it, it's that uh, there's no place on the pencil for you to do it. The device doesn't really have a way to talk to the user. And so it's pretty difficult for the user to say what they want and they just don't want to go through the hassle. And yet somehow this device needs to know but there are some other devices that it should cooperate with and others that it shouldn't. So one of the technical challenges that, um, and practical challenges is how to make that actually happen in the right way. Um, uh, and, it, and it's more than even just the problem of um, knowing which devices belong to whom. Because one approach you could take to this is to say, well, all the devices that belong to me, they're all playing on the same team. They should be willing to share openly and cooperate with each other. But uh, I don't even necessarily want that. To the extent I might have concerns about privacy, that is, that I might have concerns that some device might be chattering to an outsider about what I'm doing. Um, to the extent that I'm concerned about security vulnerabilities in one device, I don't want that device to be having a lot of teammates who are telling it things. Uh, and so there's going to be a desire to kind of keep information apart, and you have, as you often do in managing security, this tension between wanting information to flow so that you can um, provide uh, customized or um, efficient um, behavior. On the one hand, on the other hand, wanting to limit and control information flows to reduce your risk and exposure. And I think this is a very difficult thing and it's especially difficult when you have uh, ordinary people trying to manage it 
and managing it through devices that have very thin or non-existent interfaces. I think we're just starting to think about how we would navigate uh, all of these issues. Thank you very much. I, authentication becomes a major issue because the means of authentication become more and more personal. Biometrics, you mentioned, um, retinal scans aren't far off. Uh, these are just a matter of math and separating signal from noise. One of the challenges is, what are the defaults? You know, so if you are in a situation that, uh, that you're, you may not be making a lot of changes because of the structural configuration of the product, Mark, can you talk a little bit about that? The FTC has looked at this. They've, they've held a public workshop. I think been very thoughtful about soliciting comments from the public to understand you know, what are the major uh, consumer-facing concerns here. Well, sure. Um, and I, I guess I can um, sort of follow on Ed's point and talk about our TrendNet case because in addition to the workshop that we did in November, um, just before the workshop, we'd announced a settlement with a company called TrendNet, which is an IP camera um, seller. And basically, um, this allowed people to set up a camera so that you could, you know, watch watch your baby, maybe, or you know, watch your home while you were at work. And um, they actually sold it as I think it was Secure View was was the trade name. Um, so as it happened, they also had something in, in case you wanted to um, provide this live feed to the world that. There was a setting where you could sort of mark that and have that um, go to you know anyone in the world who wanted to see it. So unfortunately, this company basically didn't have a security review program. They had functionality testing, but didn't um, have security testing. And they had a, several um, flaws um, in their security. Um, and one of them was that you know basically anybody on the planet could um, view your feed, even if you hadn't chosen to make it a live feed, anyone in the world could view it anyway. And so hackers had sort of found this and I think identified, you know, like 700 particular feeds that, that you could watch that were um, otherwise intended to be private. Um, and also the, you know, when you signed into this service, your your username and password, um, they weren't encrypting at that at the time. So if you did it from a Wi-Fi, um, somebody could have gotten your username and password anyway um, if they were sort of eavesdropping on your traffic. So, um, so it obviously raises some of the authentication issues that, that Ed was talking about. But it also raises another issue with the Internet of Things, which is that um, I think things like updating software were difficult enough um, with computers, um, you know, we had questions about, you know, whether Microsoft could push out updates to their operating system or browser or what have you. Um, and I think we, we sort of got some improvements there, but we ran into some issues when we were um, basically telling um, TrendNet, hey, let people know about this flaw on their cameras. And, you know, they, they had some um, a firmware update to fix this. But it's sort of, there's no way to let people know, hey, you have this, you know, this defective software, you need an update. Um, so um, we did require them to push it out to folks to the extent that they could, and they, um, they were to contact registered users that they knew of, um, and otherwise, you know, provide a toll-free number and so forth. But still, there are probably many people out there who have these cameras and and haven't, you know, um, downloaded the fix. So, um, so anyway, that's one of the kinds of challenges that we have with these with these devices, where um, they're sort of not in a traditional thing where you know it's connected to your computer and you have some relationship with the company through your computer. Um, and it's a bilateral connection. Um, and just one last thing, following up on Alex's point about. These companies that may not be that sophisticated in dealing with, you know, network attacks because they, you know, they made pencils and suddenly they're, you know, an, an internet defense firm. I think another aspect of that is that, um, is that, you know, part of what we've been pushing is sort of security by design, 
and sort of some of these ideas like the Princeton students were asked about, well, how can you sort of you know, limit this so, so it's maybe only you, um, only information about you is getting out there instead of information about anyone. Um, and some of these questions, if you just sort of add the internet functionality to the pencil or to the refrigerator or whatever it might be, um, you haven't necessarily thought of those questions of, um, you know, this personalization that, that sort of was useful in the refrigerator context may not be all that helpful in the internet context. Um, and so if you just sort of, you know, put the Bluetooth on there and send that, all that information out without making other changes, then you may be creating new problems. I, I think um, a couple issues that were raised. One of them is software upgradability. Yay, great thing. But the root cause of almost every major high profile data breach is that there was a vulnerability that existed that wasn't patched quick enough. And so there are, there's sort of shifting tectonic plates in the software world because for years, companies have effectively sort of disclaimed liability and said, you know, there, there's gonna be flaws and we're gonna work to fix them and we're gonna update things. And uh, I, I don't know how many people saw the Snowden interview, uh, Chris Segoyan, who's, who's participated in this event in the past, uh, interviewed Ed Snowden and they talked about end-to-end -end encryption and how a lot of companies in the Valley have sort of taken their cue since everything happened with the NSA and are pushing out end-to-end -end encryption. Here that's very challenging as you said because the endpoints are now multiplying and so the attack surface is much larger. To bring it back to a legal issue though, um, on the other side, Steve, are there concerns with how regulators may be approaching this and, and do you feel that the current tool set that they have is appropriate for this new world of connected devices? Yeah, no, that's a great question. <clears throat> you know, and I, I need to preface my remarks because when you're sitting here and the, you know, the primary regulator that passes on the existence of your clients, you know, surrounding you in the room, you need to be careful. So, uh, no, with and all deference and respect, with all due deference and respect. No, and, and, and in all seriousness, um, and this isn't just sort of to be obsequious, but the, no, the FTC seriously does a great job. They don't have a lot of resources and they try and steer a middle path between, you know, gauging their enforcement, uh, response, uh, to the size of the industry, you know, the prevalence of the product uh, or service. And so my, my comments here are really aimed more at the sufficiency, uh, the adequacy of their enabling statute, not uh, to their performance, which, I, which, which again is, is really excellent. So, um, so in, terms of, in terms of, you know, the FTC, they, they typically, you'd think that, well, TrendNet, you know, that this, uh, this complaint or investigation proceeded under you know, the FTC network aware product regulation, but it didn't. There is no FTC network aware product regulation. It proceeded under section five of the FTC Act uh, that prohibits unfair and deceptive trade practices. So this is a, this is a general rubric and, you know, deceptive, fair, uh, deceptive practices are when you say that you're going to do one thing and then your product your, or your service ends up doing another and it's material to the, uh, you know, the performance of the product or the information that's shared or the bargain that the individual's getting. Unfairness is when there's something about the product that's just sort of so unconscionable uh, that it really wouldn't matter what you disclose, you can't really do this, maybe not without some sort of really express affirmative opt-in consent by the end user and might go to, for example, default settings of products and the like. However, so if you step back and you see that that's the sort of the guidance, and on the one hand, you know, Dr. Halderman and Dr. Felton have just gotten done explaining, uh, you know, a really complicated and complex landscape, right? And here we have this sort of very general consumer protection um, uh, legislation to, to cover it. And so I, w I would suggest that <clears throat> one of the things that we've seen is that really this enabling statute is, um, is too squishy, uh, both in the sense of probably, and I'll, again, you know, uh, I represent companies in this space, so I'll say, you know, arguably the enabling statute um, 
could be a little tougher on the high end in terms of having uh, some type of um, you know, more robust enforcement uh, penalty structure uh, under it, <clears throat> as well as perhaps a greater regulatory purview. But then I think also on the, on the bottom end, like for, and I, there's a recent case, the HTC case, that, uh, that dealt with pre-installed apps on HTC, uh, HTC devices and the Android permission model. And uh, the vulnerability, uh, the reported vulnerability uh, spanned, I think it was something like 12 million devices, right? A huge installed user base. And there was no, there's, there's no report from the S FTC that I'm aware or anywhere else that showed that there was ever a single device or a single individual that actually had their information or security compromised because of the vulnerability. Now the touchstone for regulatory enforcement by the FTC is a substantial harm or a likelihood of uh, substantial harm. And so, uh, you know, in the case of HTC, I'm not saying that, you know, perhaps this is um, not the type of vulnerability that we want to regulate because, of course, we want our information practices by our companies to, to be sound. But, you know, perhaps the 20-year consent degree and, and onerous reporting obligations and sort of the standard model for when you get a complaint filed against you by the FTC. It's not the only model, but it's certainly, you know, what, what you would see most often and you saw in the HTC case, maybe was a little on the, you know, didn't really fit what the nature of the, of the harm was or potential harm, I, I, I guess I would say. And then, you know, to take another case recently, there's the, and you may have heard about this in the news, there's the Wyndham Hotels case and it's currently pending in the Federal District Court in New Jersey. And that dealt with <clears throat> the uh, persistent storage of unencrypted credit card information, uh, which then ended up uh, outside of the company's trust perimeter. And you know, this is, a, this is obviously a really big deal. And um, one of the chief arguments that Wyndham has raised in, in federal district court is, hey, you FTC, you don't have authority to regulate security, right? And so the FTC, as opposed to being able to sort of, you know, really, um, focus on the substantive merits of, you know, perhaps the lack of the reported and alleged lack of security in that case. Instead, has to sit there, you know, for uh, several years on end, defending the adequacy of their enabling statute. Um, so, uh, you know, I think without any without any question, the FTC Act probably is um, is due for for some updating to kind of match up to to the landscape. Um, that confronts us today. I mean, it's very interesting in the, the Wyndham case, there's, there's many overlays, because there's also PCI, the payment card industry security standards for credit cards. And uh, that also has a lot of jockeying between the players with the, and I represent some of them, but uh, with the network saying we're gonna get tough on security because we've had these high profile uh, data breaches. And then lots of different players and payments trying to sort out uh, re substantive responsibilities with security, and then also uh, financial responsibilities. One of the uh, one of the challenges also is that there is a breach notification law in uh, most states now, and some of them are similar. Some of them are a little bit different. Should there be, let start, start back with you, Steve, should there be an Internet of Things specific breach notification? So on breach notification laws, and you know, your typical breach notification law, and just to take you know, New York as an example, you know, what counts as a breach of your sensitive information? Well, social security number, driver license number, government issued ID number, a financial account number with password or access code, and that's about it, right? So that's, that's pretty narrow um, in terms of your name, your date of birth, your email address, your mobile phone number, um, and probably a few other categories of information uh, aren't covered by that. And I think that's probably counterintuitive to what people just, you know, uh, the layperson would think is covered by a breach notification uh, requirement uh, imposed by the states. And so I, in terms of the Internet of Things and embedded technologies, you know, I think that what the breach notification uh, 
statutes try and, and, and cover makes, makes sense in its existing framework, not in terms of scope, because I think, you know, again, uh, it's really, they're fairly narrow. But, uh, you know, these statutes cover data that's under your control or, um, you know, within your system. And I think that that's probably a reasonable place to draw the line. And, you know, there are some, there are some gaps. And just to take an example of all of the, um, the instances we've heard lately with retailers and problems with point of sale um, systems and credit card uh, credit card numbers. You know, you have the situation where, let's say, you know, Bank X issued a credit card, and so the credit card is then swiped through a point of sale terminal at the retailer. Uh, now, because the retailer system was compromised, that credit card number is, you know, out being shotgunned around the internet with, you know, the uh, security code, and, um, y you know, so. The, uh, the retailer isn't going to have sufficient information to necessarily know who that person is or to put them on notice. And let's say the bank finds out that the credit card has been compromised because they monitor uh, stolen card numbers in the market for stolen card numbers. But under the existing data breach statutes, uh, I think if you asked 99 out of 100 you know, data breach lawyers whether or not uh, bank X has a duty to inform its cardholder that the, that the number was compromised in the retailer system, they would say no. Um, so, so I guess like, I, I, don't, I think in terms of data breach notification, I don't know if the Internet of Things um, necessarily uh, suggests that there should be a different structure, but I think that arguably the scope and then some of these gaps probably need, need to be addressed even irrespective of some of the Internet of Things issues. I think for, for those of us that practice in the space, one of the frustrations or limitations is the forensic evidence that's available when something's happened, and there's remarkably little. And so uh, I think you raised a couple very interesting points. One is maybe a more dynamic definition of trigger elements because of the ability to social engineer some information with other available information and get back to PII. But uh, probably not part of a breach notification scheme, I think part of a security issue is what kind of logging do uh, companies have? And for you know, InfoSec nerds, it, there's very little. Traditionally, that's one of those issues that you keep like a month or two. And, um, and even if you have those logs, you likely have who had access to a system, so like a, a check-in at a hotel, who signed in, who signed out, you don't necessarily see if information was exfiltrated, where they actually got things. And the way the current breach notification scheme works, it's really geared towards somebody demonstrating that somebody actually got the information. Mark, can you talk a little bit about uh, sort of how the FTC views the lay of the land on breach notification? Um, sure. Um, and then I might respond to Stephen briefly on the, on the issue. Um, so on breach notification, I think one key thing about the state breach notification laws is, is that they have served a great purpose in letting us know that these breaches were happening in the first place. Um, and I think that alone has been very valuable, even despite the, I mean, even in addition to the, um, the effect that they've had in letting the particular individuals involved know um, that they can, that they should take steps to protect themselves. So, um, you know, I'm here speaking for myself today, but the commission has um, actually um, come out in favor of a federal breach notification law. Um, I think there's something like 47 jurisdictions now that have it, but not every, um, not every jurisdiction does. And so federal legislation would be helpful on that. Um, as to applying it to the Internet of Things, um, you know, I, as Steve said, I think there are already um, some improvements that could be made to you know the existing notification laws. Like there, there are cases where, well, you know, a breach if your name isn't attached to it, then there's no breach notification necessary. But there are all these types of information. SSN is one of them, but you know, your financial account information, your username and password, um, that, you know, even if somebody doesn't have my name, but they have my username and password for my stock account or my bank account, then 
I'm in big trouble, right? So you'd obviously want notification for that. And the California State AG recently came out with a breach report, and they suggested just that, um, adding particularly username and password to the list of, um, of um, items covered by the, the um, breach notification law. Um, finally, just in response to Steve's point, um, I, you know, I, I appreciate the, um, support and um, I would just say that some people kind of like to the extent that we use this um, section 5 which is a general statute as Steve said going to deceptive or unfair acts or practices I think that sometimes feel like people feel like well if there's a particular data security statute that it's going to say X Y and Z um, and I feel that that is usually not true I mean we um, the Graham Leach Bliley Act requires financial institutions to safeguard data, and the the actual statutory language is about a paragraph. Um, we flesh that out considerably in our rule, but it still you know still doesn't tell companies, okay, you have to use this level of encryption or you have to do this or do that. Um, and I think some people have that mindset that that something that's passed is going to be very specific in that way. I don't think that's really um, feasible. Just to respond just very quickly to that. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. There are these, you know, Graham Leach Bliley and then also HIPAA. And although that's a little bit longer and they've got a list of data items, everyone seems to know what it means once it's been passed, you know. Um, and th I would say that those are probably very successful uh, regimes. And then also, just the last point, um, you know, to the extent they're, they're, the FTC is auguring for um, you know, a federal nationwide data breach notification statute, please, for the love of God, have Congress preempt the state <laughs> breach notifications. Ed and Alex, you guys wanted to jump in. Sure. Um, I, I guess I wanted to say something about the uh, HTC example that Steve talked about. And to be clear, uh, probably m many of you may know, I was at the FTC as chief technologist for a while, but um, this is, uh, but I was not involved in this matter, so um, I'm talking about this purely as a, uh, uh, as a private security expert. Um, and, and I'll leave it to the lawyers to argue about whether Section 5 of the FTC Act does or doesn't reach this kind of, um, uh, this instance. Uh, but it seems to me that if that, uh, if you had asked the question of whether the uh, level of security practice that um, we saw from HTC in this particular instance is reasonable or ought to be acceptable, I think the answer is pretty clearly no. Um, and if there's not a law that allows FTC enforcement with those kinds of facts, there ought to be. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, maybe the uh, the least lawyerly of the group, um, uh, but I'm I've, I've been wondering about um, the breach notification and how how you might try to adapt it to the context of um, these sensor devices because that seems seems a bit challenging. Some of these security problems that uh, we worry about as technologists are. Um, sensors that are leaking information about you before it's even getting back to um, um, a remote server to a service provider that's storing the data on your behalf. Um, if someone has the ability to say over the um, over the internet come in and talk directly to my pillow and find out whether uh, I'm, I'm uh, at home in bed or not, um, that can be a, a significant privacy leak um, without ever having that data be uh, getting back to and collected by whatever company is responsible for the security of it. So I, I wonder whether that raises challenges on the on the legal front about how to um, uh, adapt the tools we have to Internet of Things. I think one of the one of the issues that comes up when when folks try to be very thoughtful about crafting a better breach notification standard is how are you going to find out about a potential compromise in the first place? I mean, in financial services. There are CPP reports. There's, you know, you, you look at fraud experience and you can trace it back to a common point of compromise. With endpoint security and connected embedded devices, it's it's much more difficult, and uh, it it comes back to 
I think I, I hate to remove it from law completely, but it feels like privacy could be a big area of innovation this year. Uh, at South by Southwest, I think it was the emergent trend. There's an app called Secret. Anonymity is something that's very popular. God forbid companies start seeing that this is an area that they should design for and that people want this. That could create another pressure within the system. Uh, I think ultimately there's the breach notification requirements, but then there's also the security standards and the NIST standards that came out in the vein of many standards before them are very high level risk management framework. Um, but, but can we talk a little bit, uh, and I know you wanted to respond, but can you also tackle this issue of maybe software updates need to be pushed by default? Oh, well, software updates are an interesting uh, question on their own because uh, they are a, a little bit of a double-edged sword. Um, the ability to update software in a device can also be, if it's not designed and implemented correctly, can be used to install new malicious features. And uh, that's one of the capabilities that uh, historically we've also often seen people get wrong. Um, so I, I think before, um, in addition to having the ability to update software when something goes wrong, uh, we need to make sure that that's, update, that's implemented properly and carefully, um, which is probably even more of a challenge in uh, very low computational power embedded devices than it was in, in traditional uh, desktops and PCs. Um, I, I also wanted to, um, to respond quickly to your, your point about uh, privacy. I, I certainly hope privacy is going to be the next big thing this year. Um, but uh, I, I think in um, these embedded sensor contexts, these Internet of Things sensor contexts, um, there's a really interesting tension. Um, because uh, uh, these devices, many of these devices are inherently about collecting new kinds of information about you. And um, the easy problems about that, the ones we know how to solve are how to collect information, how to do the sensing, how to store that information. These are things we're good at. What we're really not as good at right now is making sense of all of that information we collect. And so there's a tendency among developers here to try to record and store as much information as they can get from, uh, from sensors in case some of it later turns out to be useful when we uh, when we improve our ability to digest that. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, the, the tension this creates is one about, um, uh, are you trying to minimize the information you're collecting, or are you trying to maximize it? Are you trying to only collect what the consumer um, immediately wants, or are you going to speculatively just store everything you can in case it later becomes useful? Um, Perhaps there is room here for um, an Internet of Things sensor device analog to uh, what we've called in security the principle of least privilege, that uh, things should have um, uh, as, uh, uh, as little potentially exploitable capability as possible. Well, maybe we want to be digesting information we're collecting at the device, making uh, what we're actually sending out and storing and logging uh, as minimal as possible. Um, in order to reduce the harm that's going to come if that information is later exposed. For the least lawyerly, I think you put your finger on the central tension in privacy law that, that, that Julie has spoken about and uh, others have focused on, which is between collection and use and where to draw the line. I think uh, the challenge you talk about is that right now you no longer even need structured data. Right, if you're a data scientist, and with Hadoop, everything can be unstructured, and even if it's structured, you'll break it into pieces. Um, Ed, can can you build off his point? Um, sure. Um, it, it's certainly true that as um, more data is available and as analytic capabilities get um, more advanced, that it gets a lot harder to predict what um, the implications might be of recording or um, releasing or, um, particular data. Uh, it can be very difficult to know what is the implication of knowing you know, whether um, something on um, someone's pillow twitched at 2.15 a.m. Um, what, 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 what might someone infer from that? Um, and so you have to think about uh, co data collection and uh, data transmission in terms of risk. Uh, you can't foresee all the implications of what you're doing in advance. 
Uh, the systems are very complicated in, in any case, even if you could, uh, in principle, uh, understand the implications of data releases, which you can't in a lot of cases. Um, it, it, in practice, it's just very difficult to know. And so you have to think from a risk standpoint, right? You want to collect less data because that reduces the risk of uh, unwanted downstream uses um, or the, it reduces the uh, likely implications of a breach. Um, and one of the problems, I think, is that uh, the legal framework um, in this area doesn't do a good job of thinking about risk. Uh, there's a tendency to want to think ex post about, uh, well, there was a breach, and now let's figure out how much harm was done and whether some legal barrier has been crossed. Uh, but what you really need in order to get um, better protection for end users is sophisticated thinking about risk. And so uh, to toss it back to, to Mark and, and uh, Steve, is the section five is really all about disclosure and, and fairness and adequacy of, of representation. Is there room for this uh, concept of risk within the existing framework? So, you know, I think that you really have to stretch it to, to say that there is. I mean, you could bring it under the unfairness prong, but I think that, you know, I, I just think there's only so far that that you know you can you can ride that that language, and it would probably you know be a healthy exercise for everyone to contemplate what a uh, you know a slightly more expressive provision on risk might look like, and and maybe and and I agree totally with Ed too on the HT, HTC exam, <clears throat> example, and you know maybe even with a more expressive provision also have uh, perhaps tiers, you know, for what constant, you know, for, for certainly some things are more serious than others, I think, you know, or, or that might be appropriate or, or questions of scale, but, you know, the time has really, has really come for this. So I, th I think that it's, it's, you know, it's time. I would say, I mean, in some ways, and, and picking up on Ed's point, I mean, I, in some ways we, um, we already do, focus on risk in that, you know, we had, for example, the Lookout case, which was a company that provided I-9 verifications, and um, these involve basically proving that you're an American citizen. So they often involve passport numbers and driver's licenses and you know, name and address and, you know, a bunch of other sensitive information to authenticate who you are. And um, in that case, they basically had um, somebody, actually I think it was somebody who worked for a company that they were sort of making a presentation to and this person sort of realized, oh well, um, instead of putting in you know, my company name, you can put in another company name um, and you can see everything that you, know, that, that company would have had access to. Or um, you, could, you could just put in the pass the admin, you know, username test and the password test, and you could also get into the network. So, so we brought um, that case um, in part as an unfairness case, and it wasn't that there had been a particular actual breach where people had been harmed, but it was just the likelihood that, you know, somebody was going to get in there. The security was so bad in, in so many different ways. Um, so in that way, we do, you know, go after risk under existing Section 5 law. Coming from um, coming from American Express, when the uh, when the recession happened, and uh, American Express took the bailout money and we became a bank holding company subject to Fed review, the Fed and the the bank holding companies do have an additional layer of granularity on security and, and risk management. They have the FFIEC standards, multi-factor authentication, things like that. As software eats the world. I believe from a legal compliance fraud risk management standpoint, risk management that was developed in financial services is now bleeding out to other industries. And I think it's a very good mindset, but it, it's slightly anathema to the startup mentality, which is let me grab as much information as I can, because I actually don't know how I'm going to monetize and make money yet. And maybe I'm going to figure that out when I get my series A or, or series B. Can, uh, can each of you talk about how you see the Internet of Things playing out over the next five to ten years and how that tension may get resolved? Starting with uh, Alex. 
Well, I, I think that's a that's a really difficult tension because um, on the one hand, um, yes, security is um, is hugely important. We can see looming risks. Um, security is very hard in some ways to retrofit after you've already designed and developed a complicated system. On the other hand, I'd hate to see um, us impose uh, costs that are so onerous that um, the students developing prototypes in its class would have to start thinking about um, security before they designed uh, their uh, they're very low cost devices here. And I think there's, um, there's some risk that if we, um, uh, we go in the, uh, the wrong direction, um, we're going to just uh, uh, eliminate applications that would otherwise be, uh, be created, be happening, and be, be very, low, very low in cost. Um, so I, I think uh, we're likely in the, the next few years, I think, to see some very memorable, very high profile security disasters in Internet of Things that are going to uh, raise a lot of public awareness about the potential risks. Um, on the other hand, I think most of the things that could go wrong will remain speculative harms rather than actual harms because there, we can just imagine so many, um, so many possible uh, kinds of risks. Um, but I think uh, uh, for the most part, uh, they're, they're going to, I hope, remain uh, ones that are in our imagination. Um, uh, uh, I think security um, is going to continue to be a problem uh, in the, the five to ten year horizon here, no matter what we do. Um, it's just, uh, it has been for the history of embedded <coughs> systems, uh, a, a weak spot. And as, uh, as long as we're continuing to really push the envelope in terms of what technology can do um, in uh, uh, Internet of Things devices. Um, I, I think security is un unfortunately going to remain a fairly low priority among the different things that developers are trading off. I think uh, we wanted to leave enough time to have a few questions. And, and Joel, did you have a question to start us off? You usually have a great question. I didn't, but I'll come up with one. Um, I'm going to uh, pick up um, on Alex's last point there, saying security is unfortunately likely to be low down on the priority scale. So my question then is, you know, should law do something about that? Um, we, we've heard in a way that the data breach issues where it may be coming from a device suggest that the current legal regime will be totally ineffective um, in helping users. The challenges between, um, the, I'll call it device security and the network security, the communications between the device and over the network um, seem to be a, a critical link. Are there places where law should try to step in proactively and raise the priority of security among the developers? Um, let, me, uh, let me take a crack at that. Um, one of the things we've seen as um, uh, the, the scope of the types of products and the types of companies that are uh, working on network software has spread is that it seems like every industry sector takes a while to figure out that security is going to be a big problem for them. Um, right? The early, um, for example, the early web technology companies, the early browsers, it took them a while to figure that out. Operating system vendors, even, so even core technology areas uh, it took some years and some hard experience for them to figure out security was a big problem. They needed to embrace um, uh, and embrace this issue and be proactive. Um, and we've seen as uh, other areas have um, computerized and gotten networked that uh, that seems to happen over and over. Uh, and that's the pattern that's going to continue to happen, I think, if something doesn't change. That you're going to have all these companies that, um, as, as Alex discussed earlier, um, don't, uh, don't realize at first that they're in the security business uh, and they're in the privacy business um, and learn that the hard way. Um, the, the question is what, if there's anything we can do about that to make them more proactive, uh, whether the law or technology or even just the way we talk about it can change in a way that, uh, that, um, uh, that really staves that off. Um, and I'm not sure I have a great answer to that. I, I think the, the one thing that I would suggest for folks and had a conversation with a client who looks like they dodged a bullet. You know, there was something going on, there really wasn't. They took a close look at themselves, they're all breathing a sigh of relief. And I said, Well, you know, this is your new normal to the executive team. 
you are in a state of continuous monitoring. And so there's one element, which is can we get more granular in laws with uh, the level of encryption that's prescribed, things like that. Then there's the structural issue and a mindset change, which says we, you know, we're, we're all sort of security yeah. and privacy businesses. Right. I mean, almost every way of connecting things together turns out to be insecure. So um, if, unless you're really careful about how you do it, uh, your product will have major security problems. And it's an iterative process, right? Which brings us back to the, the patching issues and the zero days and the vulnerabilities, which is there's this leapfrog with the folks who are trying to get in. Steve, you wanted to? Well, you know, just to pick up on Alex's point um, that depending on how far down the ladder you go in, in, terms, of, in terms of scale, you don't want to squelch the sort of generative um, <clears throat> uh, you know, processes and, and where, where people are developing sort of really great things that l later you know, uh, turn out to be really important. I mean, certainly, like in the HIPAA space, clients, uh, there's all sorts of things that people would like to do but are scared to death to do because they, you know, they fear uh, HIPAA compliance. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, I, I think it's a hard, it's, so it's a hard question, question, but yeah. Let me, push, let me push back respectfully on that one. Yeah. HIPAA, a couple of years ago, you couldn't get the major tech companies to sign a business associate agreement. And then about a year ago, they all started signing. And so, so I think that there is a way for companies to embrace, and, and some things that are prescribed by law are actually helpful to running a successful business. So there, there is a, I think there's a balance that's necessary. Right, but, but I would like, say, for example, the use of, with taking the pillow example and the Bluetooth technology, actually had a, um, a client that for a mobile medical device had, was using Bluetooth for a wearable sensor. And, you know, there's a lot of money spent on trying to figure out, both on the legal side and the tech side, you know, which Bluetooth version can we use? And if we do use it, are we actually, you know, going to be HIPAA compliant? And oh, by the way, what's the threat anyway? What's the, you know, the, yeah. the range and, and everything? So, you know, and, and at some level, and I'm going to, you know, I didn't throw this out there, it'd probably be controversial, but like what's the optimal level of vulnerability in on the development side that, that you know, because at some level these things become expensive. So I, these are hard questions. And also though. usability issues yeah. come in, but, but we should open it up because we don't have much time left to uh, a couple questions if there are any. Uh, looks like in the back. I'm Steve Bellavin. Uh, the more that device vendors know about security breaches involving their products, the more monitoring they can do to look for them, the more ability they have to push software updates, the more they inherently have to know about the customers and what other de devices these uh, their device is talking to, because that could be part of it, which in turn implicates privacy. How should we deal with this? Well, that's, that's an easy question. <laughs> I, I think um, really the only way to deal with it is to be cautious about which devices chatter with which other devices, right? Uh, and from a company that is concerned about security implications of their product for legal or liability reasons or other reasons, um, you know, there's a certain risk that they don't control that uh, arises from a casual interconnection with somebody else's uh, Internet of Things products. Uh, and so I think you'll see some caution about that kind of interconnection outside of product lines. Um, I hope that there will be work toward um, secure standards for certain kinds of uh, interaction between these devices. Um, but uh, I don't think there's a good answer to that, and I do think that there's um, possibly significant risk that comes from it. I think the, the lamp should just start flashing when there's been a data breach. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. Uh, probably have time for one more question if there is any. Hi, I'm Roxana Jambasho from Columbia University. Um, so Alex, uh, you made a fairly grim assessment about how security will play out in the next five to ten years. I wonder what do you feel uh, all of you, I guess, feel uh, are the main reasons. Uh, is it the security mindset that is perhaps lacking? Uh, or is it uh, that we are missing some kinds of building blocks technology that would enable uh, you know, much better, a much better security play field, uh, um, you know, um, right? 
um, if we had them. Um, and if, it would be great if you could focus, for example, on the data collection issue that you, uh, that you raised. Um, sure. So um, I think um, we are, we're lacking a couple of things. So um, uh, I think having, uh, having better software building blocks for use in embedded systems is, is really important. And the libraries, the tools, the tool chains that people use um, uh, use today are just starting to get up to the level of, um, uh, say, end-to-end uh, -end crypto support and so forth that we're used to in uh, uh, more traditional client-server applications. So there's, there's some amount of that. Um, there's quite a bit of cultural appreciation for security lacking. Um, and I think uh, uh, educating companies, educating developers about the kinds of risks they face, about thinking about privacy in a sophisticated way is really important. Um, but I think the, the more fundamental thing, though, is that we're going to be continuing to push the envelope about what sensors can do um, for the foreseeable future. And um, if um, adding a security layer is going to mean that your device is going to be twice as expensive, twice as big, or have a battery that lasts half as long, um, people uh, in, in many applications will just say those trade-offs aren't worth it. Uh, we'd rather have um, the ability to collect more data to make our devices uh, cheaper or longer lasting, um, uh, all else being equal. Um, so I, I think that kind of that kind of technological envelope pushing is going to continue to make security a relatively low priority, at least as people are trying to develop devices that do um, that have have uh, very new kinds of capabilities that we're we're just starting to perceive. So I, I would just close it off by saying that security is very much an afterthought now, and most security systems are insecure, and it's a it's a matter of somebody being able to find that. And if it's a widely used, commercially available platform, everybody knows about it at the same time and has a toolkit and exploits it. I think, uh, again, on a positive note, that I think that we're at an inflection point in the market for privacy and security features. I don't necessarily see privacy and security as a product themselves, but I think that they are a feature, and, and I think it's a feature that people are willing to pay for, which could take us out of this world of free services where quid pro quo for that is you know mass collection of your information. And we could easily have a point where this whole thing is turned on its head, I hope, where you have an app or a, a Fitbit type product that has proactive security measures, meaning you have an app that blocks somebody from filming you on Google Glass. And so I think right now we're in a very much defensive posture, but hopefully one of the things that can change to meet this challenge is, you know, young people getting excited about building these things and not to pander too much to the, to the Trade Commission, but building in security by design. Thanks, folks.